Concord. What feelings do you get when you hear the word? Is it sacred? Is it sacrilege? It was supposed to mean an agreement, one between England and France to build and fly the world's first supersonic airliner. Two countries great in power, but not always in agreement about how to use it, but in great cooperation to change the face of air transport and to build one of the most iconic and beautiful airplanes ever made. Concord wasn't without its issues, though. An accord between England and France was already a difficult enough thing, the two countries not always seeing eye to eye on political issues. They spoke different languages. Russia was developing their own supersonic transport, too, and to top it off, the general public wasn't always happy about the idea of sonic booms over their houses and of high-altitude pollution damaging the ozone layer. Eventually, though, the Concorde prevailed, and for roughly 30 years, we had one of the greatest aircraft designs in history, transporting the well-heeled between continents in less than four hours. But despite its success, the Concorde story ends in disaster. The flight of Air France Flight 4590 in July 2000, the only Concorde crash ever, signaled the demise of the program. With Air France retiring their Concorde fleet soon after, and British Airways hanging on all the way till 2003, October 24th to be exact. This is Podcasting on a Plane. I'm Brandon Gonzalez. Thanks for joining. The end of Concorde bothered me. At the time, mostly as an av geek, sad to see the end of an era. I had a model of one that I built, was sitting on my shelf as a kid. I remember falling asleep looking at it, and I always dreamed of flying on one, but I never got to. I saw one once, though, sitting there at Kennedy, waiting to go back to London as I taxied by and something a whole lot less impressive. I remember being surprised at how small it looked, especially for something so much larger than life. But as I became an adult and one employed in industry, the demise of Concorde bothered me even more, but in a different way. I got over the misty-eyed stuff, but I could never really reconcile why the end happened like it did. And it's been 15 years, almost to the day actually, since the final Concorde flight landed at Heathrow. Nice to commemorate, but still nothing has come forward to replace it. I mean, we had the technology 50 years ago, right? And more importantly, why did we get rid of it in the first place? We've all taken guesses to the story of why. I mean, one crashed, right? It ran over a piece of metal dropped by a Continental DC-10, soon to be retired itself. The metal piece pierced the fuel tank, it caught into a spectacular fire and crashed into a hotel. It was awful. But planes do crash sometimes. And when these disasters happen, they usually don't retire the entire aircraft type. Well, they're old and they're, they're hard to maintain. I often hear that one cited as a reason too. Well, I don't know. We're still flying around in MD-80s, aren't we? The Air Force still flies derivatives of the 707 and the B-52, don't they? Well, I was never really able to buy cost as a reason to retire a Halo type. So despite young aspiring pilot me's ambitions to become an airline CEO someday, I could never really get the answers I wanted. And I had other questions too. Like, what did it take to become a Concorde pilot? To get picked? To go through the training? And to fly what in my mind even today might be the perfect flying gig? So, I did some research, and no matter where I looked, I kept running across the same name. A man who, at least to me, is the British expert and ambassador of the whole dream. His name is John Hutchinson. Now, John made a name for himself, not just as a Concorde captain, which in and of itself would be a world-class achievement, but he's also a go-to expert when it comes to anything Concorde. He's often called upon by the BBC to comment or narrate any event involving it. Go ahead, Google his name. Or don't, I'll save you the trouble, because he's right here today. John gave me the honor of nearly four hours of interview time, and I thought the best way to share them with you would be to split our talks up into individual stories and share them with you each day this week in what I'm calling Concord Week. Each day, you'll hear John share an exclusive story about what it was like to actually live the dream. And at the end, our interviews culminate with the ultimate answer to what really happened that horrible day in Paris, and with a couple of plot twists that will make your hair stand on end. If you want to learn even more about John, his upbringing, his career, his book, Wind Beneath My Wings, it's available on Amazon, and there's a link in the show notes. Now, I do have to level with you, though. John is a wonderful guy, and I picture him sitting in his office in his lovely English country estate and doing me the honor of recording all this for you, but the problem is that most lovely English country estates don't have great internet, and you're going to notice the sound quality isn't exactly what you've come to expect from the show. I know, I'm sorry, but what John has to say is so good that I didn't want to withhold even a second of it from you. So I hope you'll understand, and who knows, maybe someday the time will be right, and we can have him here in person. In today's episode, John talks about his upbringing, his time as an RAF pilot, corporate flying in Europe in the 60s, and most importantly, what it took to get selected to the elite group who got to fly Concorde. Over the next few days, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss Wednesday's episode where John recounts his narrow escape from a burning airliner at Heathrow, or on Thursday where we hear about becoming a BBC broadcaster and Concorde pilot personality known to the royal family, and most importantly on Friday where we hear the true story of the crash of Air France Flight 4590. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Welcome to Concord Week. Mr. John Hutchinson, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being on Podcasting on a Plane, sir. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Brandon, and very, very nice to be talking to you. Excellent. You know, you, I think to most of the English-speaking world, are one of the foremost experts on the Concord. Your videos and interviews with you are just all over all over YouTube. You've starred in BBC-produced television programs and so on, documenting how the Concord was flown across the Atlantic. And you were even known to the royal family as, as the national expert on the Concorde. How did you become one of the foremost experts on the Concorde? <laughs> I wouldn't, first of all, say so I was one of the foremost experts. So um, uh, all I can claim is that I spent 15 absolutely wonderful years on that aeroplane. And as far as I'm concerned, out of the 70 aeroplanes or so that I've flown in my life, um, Concorde stands out in a class all of its own. It, it was such a special, iconic, beautiful, responsive, fantastic piece of technology. Um, and I just love it with a passion, um, as indeed was the case with pretty well anybody who was involved with the project whether they were pilots, flight engineers, cabin crew, dispatchers, ground engineers. I mean, the team of ground engineers who supported that airplane were just phenomenal, phenomenal. And without them, the whole operation would never have worked or could possibly have happened. They were just amazing people in the background, unsung heroes. Sounds good. Now, you were born not to an aviation family and not even in England. You were born in India, is that right? Yep, I well, it was India then. In fact, where I was actually born is now Pakistan. Um, I was born in Raw Pindi. My father was in the Indian Army and he spent the 1930s going up and down the border with Afghanistan, which is kind of topical. Um, and I may say, by the way, that he had the most monumental respect for Afghan tribesmen. Uh, he always said to me that you underrated them at your peril. And uh, I suspect the Europeans and the Americans and the Russians have all found out that fact to their cost. Uh, but uh, he spent um, the 1930s, as I say, um, going up and down in Waziristan on the border with um, Afghanistan. And I was actually born in Royal Pindi. And then subsequently, his various postings took him all over the place. So I've lived in, in Delhi. I've lived in Agra. I've lived in a hill town um, called Nainital, uh, which is a fabulous place. And also in Simla, now known as Shimla. Um, it, it, it's had a slight name change, but uh, similar is a lovely place. Six and a half thousand, seven thousand feet up in the foothills of the Himalayas. And, uh, you know, used to get snow there in the winter. I used to go ice skating um, at an ice skating rink in Simla during the winter. It was a wonderful place to live. And of course, you know, this was all through the Second World War. So, um, I'm afraid I saw very little of, or like nothing of the Second World War. I lived a very privileged life in India. How does one go from a beginnings like that and then decide one day that they would like to be a pilot? Well, that's a good question. I don't know really the answer to that other than to say that I knew from the age of about six or seven that I wanted to be a pilot. Um, don't ask me why I knew that because I, I, haven't, I don't know the answer. Um, there was something about flight that captivated my imagination. I never actually saw an aeroplane when I lived in India. Uh, I used to collect books about aeroplanes. The Boys Wonder Book of Aeroplanes or something like that was one of the books I had. I used to collect books on aircraft identification. 
I just loved airplanes as a passion. And when we came back to England in 19, uh, in the winter of 1947-1948, shortly after we got back uh, to England, um, my mother took me uh, down to the Isle of Wight and she took me up for a joyride in a tiger moth, to Havilland tiger moth. And I suppose at this stage I was about 14 years old, something like that, 13, 14 years old. And all that flight in the tiger moth did was convince me about something that I already knew that I wanted to fly. And on my 18th birthday, I joined the Royal Air Force. Incredible. Were you able to get into the Air Force immediately on your first try and then just get a pilot slot or how did that go? Yep. I applied to the Royal Air Force, got accepted. I got sent out to Canada for training on what was in those days a NATO training scheme. So uh, I did my basic flying training, my preliminary flying training um, at a place called Moose Jaw in Saskatchewan. And my ab initio training aircraft that I learned to fly on was the North American Harvard or the Texan, as you would have called it. The Harvard as an ab initio trainer. I'd never, I was 18 years old, or, well, 18 and a half now. I'd never driven a motor car in my life. I had a rather, um, on, uh, what's the right word? Unsympathetic, I think, would be a good word. Flying instructor. The Harvard terrified me, absolutely terrified me. And I had this unsympathetic flying instructor. And it was really very much touch and go that I was ever going to make the grade. And my first flying test that I took, called the preliminary clearhood test, they called it, I flunked that massively. I mean, it, it really was a complete disaster as a flying test. And um, fortunately for me, the result of that was that I was sort of under review as to whether I could continue with my training. I got a new instructor and he was very patient and sympathetic and kind. And he slowly built my confidence up and then suddenly something sort of clicked inside me with the hand-eye coordination. And from that moment on, I have never had a problem with any flying course I've ever done since. Uh, so I owe the Harvard a huge debt of gratitude um, for, for teaching me above all, I suppose, great respect for airplanes and for all the sort of processes of flight. It was a demanding, challenging aeroplane. And if you didn't treat it properly, it could bite you. And that was a lesson I learned big time on the Harvard. And I, I always sort of send grateful thanks to the Harvard for giving me such a wonderful grounding in flying. After I did the Harvard training, I then went on to jet training at Gimli in Manitoba, where I flew the T-33 the Silver Star, or Shooting Star, I can't remember, I think it was called the Silver Star. And uh, that was a lovely aeroplane, actually. And I got my wings in Canada, came back to United Kingdom in January 1957, we're talking about now. And the Royal Air Force, when they got me back in England, they felt that what they had to teach me to do now was how to fly in English weather and over the English countryside. Very different from flying over Saskatchewan, I can tell you. And suddenly here I was confronted by low cloud, poor visibility, um, roads turning in all sorts of funny directions, towns and villages and things merging into one another. Completely different sort of landscape to Saskatchewan, and um, that was quite a learning curve, actually. And that was flying the de Havilland Vampire. And of course, what I wanted to do, uh, like anybody of my age, I guess, was to go on to fighters, to go on to the Hawker Hunter, which was the great jet fighter of the time in the Royal Air Force. And 
sadly for me, a uh, chap who was then, I can't remember what his title was, he was a politician who was sort of Minister of Aviation or whatever his proper title was, um, a gentleman called Duncan Sands, he decreed that they were never going to require uh, pilots anymore in the Air Force, uh, fighter pilots anymore in the Air Force. It was all going to be done with surface-to-air missiles. And the result of all that was that none of my course went on to fighters. I ended up being posted into Coastal Command. And that was to fly. And at the time, I was very disappointed in this. Looking back on it now, I'm very proud of it. Um, I was flying the Mark I Shackleton, the Avro Shackleton, which was a direct descendant of the Lancaster bomber. And the Mark I Shackleton was a tailwheel airplane. Uh, wasn't the subsequent versions of the Shackleton had nose wheels. Uh, the Mark I was a tail dragger, literally a direct descendant of the Lancaster. And looking back on it now, I'm, I'm really very proud that I mastered that great aeroplane with its four Rolls-Royce Griffin engines and contra-rotating propellers. And uh, it was a great aeroplane, and it had a very long service in the Royal Air Force, by the way. Um, anyway, to cut a long story short, I was posted out to Singapore, to a squadron out there at RAF Changi, which, of course, now is Singapore International Airport. In those days, it was Royal Air Force Changi. And I had two and a bit very happy years in Singapore. Then I came back to England and I went to the Central Flying School to become a flying instructor. And then my last three years in the Royal Air Force, I spent as a basic flying instructor at um, an RAF station called Syreston, not very far from Nottingham in, Eng in England. And th uh, that was a wonderful three years that I had as an instructor. And um, it was a great privilege, really, to teach young men how to fly airplanes. Um, and I loved it. Would you say that your experience with your first instructor versus your second instructor back in Canada affected the way that you were an instructor when it was your turn? Yeah, probably. <laughs> yes, you're probably absolutely right. Yes, I did. I had learned the lesson that being unsympathetic wasn't wasn't a very good recipe for teaching people to fly. Um, well, at the end of, of my tour as a flying instructor, I realized um, that I, if I stayed in the Air Force, I was going to um, run out of flying jobs as as I sort of progressed up the the, um, the rank structure. And all I knew was that I wanted to fly airplanes. I did not want to sort of fly desks in Whitehall or anything like that. So I thought, well, I'd better leave the Air Force. And I duly did. And got a job doing corporate flying with a company called McAlpine Aviation at Luton Airport. And that was flying a whole variety of uh, different uh, single-engine and twin-engined airplanes. The ones that particularly stick out in my mind was the Piaggio 166, which had pusher propellers and a gull wing, uh, very flexible airplane. You could land it on grass strips very readily. And it was a great sort of gentleman's aerial carriage, really. It was a lovely lovely airplane to fly, and the McAlpine family, who are, are building engineering uh, contractors in this country, um, they used to love that Piaggio. That was their favorite met method of transport. They also had Cessna 310s, which is another lovely airplane, actually, and one that I particularly remember, which is a fascinating aircraft, was the Helio Courier which is a short takeoff and landing airplane. I think it was a 395 horsepower uh, Lycoming engine, and it had a hell of a lot of grunt. And uh, basically, it was an airplane that by the time you'd opened the throttle up fully, you were airborne. 
it had the most remarkable short takeoff and short landing performance. And I used that a lot with McAlpines, uh, taking racehorse owners, trainers, and jockeys from various um, grass strips and paddocks all around the country to take them to the various race meetings that they were going to on any particular day. And that was a tremendous amount of fun. I got to know, I got to know England um, like the back of my hand, always flying low level, following roads, turn right at that telephone box. It was that sort of flying, the sort of very basic, almost bush flying type of flying. Absolutely fascinating. How long were you a, a corporate type pilot? That was from 1963 to 1966 that I was doing that corporate flying. And I did something like 700 hours a year um, during that period. Got a lot of flying time in, all single pilot operation, no, no two pilot operation, nothing like that. The McAlpines didn't believe in hiring two pilots where one could do the job. <laughs> So it was it was hard work, but it was very very interesting and rewarding work. And then in 1966, the airlines started recruiting, and I knew basically that long term, I wanted to get into the airlines, and I was offered jobs by Qantas, the Australian airline, by BEA, British European Airways, and by BOAC. British Overseas Airways. BOAC and BEA, by the way, of course, merged in the sort of uh, mid-1970s to become British Airways. But in those days, they were BEA and BOAC, two separate airlines. Anyway, um, I would have chosen Qantas, I think, out of instinct. I love Australia. It's a fantastic country to bring young children up in. And we'd got two uh, young boys, and I thought that would be a great opportunity to go out to Australia. But my mother was dying of cancer at that time, and I thought, no, I can't disappear to Australia with that going on. Uh, so I ruled Qantas out. Uh, so, you know, in a sort of strange way, how fate works. My mother dying of cancer made me end up making the decision that I was going to fly with a British airline. And I decided on BOAC uh, because they flew long distance and worldwide as opposed to regional and just European flying only. And of course, because I decided to join BOAC, that subsequently led on, of course, to the opportunity to go on to Concord. So, you know, it's, it's, it's funny sort of looking back on it, how you make these decisions without knowing what the consequences of those decisions may be. And that particular decision I made led to the most um, enormous privilege of my life, i.e. flying that beautiful airplane, Concord. So anyway, I joined BOAC and I joined, obviously, as a co-pilot, um, the second officer to start with, then a first officer. And I was on the Boeing 707, which was a, a, a fine aeroplane, not one I particularly enjoyed flying. It was demanding. It was a bit clunky, I think. I, I think I'd sort of slightly describe um, the Boeing 707 as a sort of equivalent of a Ford motor car an aerial version of a Ford motor car, if that's not being unkind to 707s and Ford motor cars. Um, and what was interesting about that, and I love telling pilots in this day and age this, one of the first things I had to do was learn how to become a navigator. I mean, we're so used now to GPS and INS and we know exactly where we are to within a few feet of, of, of uh, exact position on the, on the planet at any particular moment. Back then, none of those things existed. And the way you navigated a 707 
was taking star shots with a sextant. We had a periscopic sextant, which is stuck up through a hatch in the top of the flight deck. And you do sun shots, moon shots, star shots, reduce those shots down to a sort of tabular form that you could plot on a chart. And by those means, you could get a fix. We also used Loran, long range aid to navigation. And we used um, a console as well. And by means of these various radio aids and, and astro navigation, you got fixes, three position line fixes, which told you more or less where you were sort of 10 or 15 minutes ago. And every time you'd done a fix, you'd then have to go into the exercise of taking your next fix. And it was very hard work. And the route that uh, BOEC used for learning to become a navigator was to fly from London to Bermuda. And just think about that. If you miss Bermuda, you really are in trouble. Um, there's no other land for 800 miles, at least. And, you know, all this business of the Bermuda Triangle, as far as I'm concerned, that was very simply a function of the fact that navigation wasn't terribly precise. And if you missed the tiny island of Bermuda, then you were in real trouble and you'd run out of fuel and you'd end up ditching. And I don't think there have been any aviation versions of Bermuda Triangle type incidents ever since um, GPS came into, into being. So that was an interesting period of my life. I can't honestly say I enjoyed navigation. Um, my navigation charts used to look a little bit as though a spider had been crawling around all over them. Uh, so it was quite a relief to me when in 1971, in January 1971, I was posted onto the second course that BOAC had for the Boeing 747. And suddenly here I was sitting in an airplane with inertial navigation systems, a proper navigation system, and I didn't have to worry about navigating anymore. And this was a huge and monumental relief to me, I can tell you. And I grew to love the 747. It's a magnificent airplane, um, wonderful, wonderful um, airliner that, you know, the fact that it's still flying in various versions to this very day says a lot for what a wonderful piece of design it was. It was a game changing airliner, massively so, and um, as a beautiful airplane to fly. I mentioned earlier that I didn't particularly like flying the 747, but it was uh, the 707, it was a bit clunky. The 747 wasn't clunky at all. It was a very responsive airplane and a very delightful one to fly. I spent, let's see, uh, 1971 until 1976 when I was posted onto the Vickers VC-10 to do a command course. So this was just nine years after I joined um, BOAC. I was actually, no, it was 1975, I'm sorry. It was 1975 I was posted onto the VC-10 to do the command course. I actually gained my command I was confirmed as a captain in BOAC in January of 1976. Yes, that's right. So I did the command course in the sort of fall of 1975 um, and gained my command just, just under 10 years from the date that I joined the airline, which was remarkable. Um, I just happened to join the airline at a wonderful moment. Um, when they were starting a recruiting drive and I was at the lead edge of that recruiting drive and you know there were a lot of pilots who joined a year or two after me who waited 15 years or more before they got a command so I was very very lucky in terms of my timing to get um, a command course so quickly. The VC-10 I was on that for Oh, from 19, from January 1976 as a captain 
until the spring of 1977. So I was only on the VC-10 for about 15 months. And to my utter and total astonishment, in the spring of 1977, I put in a speculative bid for Concord, never thinking for a moment that I'd get anywhere near it. And to my utter astonishment, I found myself on the third course for the Concorde. And that's where I stayed, of course, for the rest of my time in the airline until I was kicked out into retirement, kicking and screaming and protesting because I did not want to say farewell to that beautiful aeroplane. Wow. As I listen to John recount how everything transpired, I just keep thinking that everything happens for a reason. No matter what your personal beliefs are about how the universe functions, sometimes it's just uncanny how people end up exactly where they need to be. John's a fantastic spokesperson for this part of the aviation history. And again, I'm honored that he spent the time with me to enlighten all of us about how it was. Now, since you're still listening, I know you're a special kind of listener. And as such, you've probably noticed the audio quality of the interview is a little less than you'd probably expect from podcasting on a plane. And I know we had some computer issues. They're rooted in the way that things are done in rural Europe, internet speeds, a microphone issue, you know. But there wasn't a lot that could be done, and I figured you'd want all the content anyway. So John was such a gentleman about it and about our difficulties that I couldn't scrap the whole project. So we soldiered on, and believe me, you're not going to want to miss any more of the content in the next three days either. Make sure you're subscribed so you can get each of the next episodes with John all this week on Podcasting on a Plane. Before we wrap up, iTunes and other podcatchers like Google Play, Stitcher, they all rank podcasts based large on reviews, and I'd really appreciate if you'd head over there and leave one. Since you're probably holding your phone right now anyway, it'll only take a second. Plus, it's totally free, and it'll go a long way to help others find the podcast so we can grow our community and promote this great thing we call aviation for everyone. Plus, I'll probably read it on the show. Until next time, your frequency change is approved, and report back on this frequency tomorrow for episode number two of Concord Week. Good day. <laughs>